So hi, everybody, and welcome to Decoding Culture. This is a new show uh, that we're putting on the channel. This is the first episode. And the idea is that we come together for conversation um, and really decode culture, look at what's happening in culture, try to make sense of it live. And today we're looking at the rise of new religions that we're seeing uh, kind of explode into culture at the moment. And I'm joined by Jules Evans and Jonathan Peugeot. Uh, Jonathan, uh, a lot of our viewers might know because he is the host of The Symbolic World, brilliant uh, channel, YouTube channel, and also an expert in religious symbolism. And Jules is a best-selling author and philosopher. Uh, recently, he's been writing a lot about a concept called conspirituality, which we're going to talk about, what exactly that means. And I'm really excited to have both of you guys here because you both know a lot about the history of religion and, and really what religion is. So welcome. It's good to be here. Thanks for having us. Cool. So I thought it might be good to just start uh, with the, the premise and to maybe question even the premise that, that we're starting with. You know, I, I look out in, you know, what's been going on the last few years and I see what looks to me very much like the, the birth of new religious movements, very often wrapped in ideology. So there's wokeism, there's QAnon, there's uh, conspirituality, which we'll talk about as well, and quite a few more. But do you guys uh, see that as religion or, or something else? Maybe, maybe Jules, you could, you could start us off. Um, well, we, we need a definition of religion, I guess. Um, I suppose one can define a religion as, as something that binds people together um, from religio, that gives them a sense of meaning and that is invested with some kind of faith. Uh, a, a kind of sacredness there's uh, and perhaps uh, a desire for certainty a kind of cosmic certainty um and in that sense yes i think people are very much looking for that uh today um there i think there are these things which um have the form of religion in the sense that people are so invested in them and see um, opponents to their belief systems, not just as people who disagree, but as somehow kind of existential threats. Um, and we can discuss whether that's a new thing. I think that's just, I think that's just something fundamental to, to being human, that we are just the, the myth-making animal. Um, but I think you see that more in very stressful, turbulent times. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've been trying to address, <coughs> excuse me, is how this religious drive or the the drive towards being embedded in a story, and also as you said, Julian, the idea of having things that bind us together towards a common, uh, let's say, a, a common direction, having a common transcendent ideal or a transcendent purpose. I think that this is an ine inevitably human. It's just part of what we are, and as Kind of materialism tried to get rid of that or tell us that it was that it was superstition that it was bunk that it was just something that that was added on top of what a human person is then it just comes back it just ends up flooding back in through all these strange cracks and strange uh images and it also takes on a weird materialistic uh shape and so what in a, what in Vedanta hinduism would be like a hierarchy of gods ends up now being material hierarchies of conspiratorial people that are controlling reality. And so the, the, the vision ends up being similar, but in a weird twisted kind of way where we have these images of, of uh, human hierarchies that act the way that the ancient principalities, ancient hierarchies of principality would function. Yeah, it just, it just strikes me as you guys are talking that there's this idea that there's a religious impulse, which is deeply, deeply human, is one that I think we probably would all agree on to some extent, but is not necessarily agreed on by, by materialism. And I know, you know, Carl Jung uh, wrote about, he, he kind of asked the question at one point, where did all the sprites and the demons and the kind of the animistic objects go? Because they just kind of disappeared with modernism. And then uh, his argument was that we projected them into our machines. You know, they had to go somewhere. So, you know, they went into the trains and they went into the planes. These things, we don't understand how they work. I, I think about that sometimes in terms of the internet, because a lot of the spread of these new 
whatever we want to call them, belief systems are, are happening online. And in a sense, we're projecting all this energy into the online world and then getting this reflection back of all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But they're still there. They're more incarnate than they were before. I mean, what do you think furries are? Like there, there are plenty of, there are plenty of manifestations of these kind of demonic fairy type things, but they, they actually end up being more embodied maybe even than they were before. Like you look at extreme body modification. You look at people who cover themselves in strange tattoos and do go out of their way to look inhuman. This is, this is manifestations of the types of, of the types of, let's say, encounters that people would have had in the forest with some strange, you know, hybrid, hybrid creature, you know, in their perception, at least. And I mean, I, I think Jung also said the gods have become diseases. So Pan has become panic. Uh, Phobos, the god of fear, has become phobia uh, and so on. And and I think the religion of um, of the DSM and of modern psychiatry, which very much, you know, the materialist um, culture, which rejected religion as delusion, has aspects of a religion itself. Mm. Uh, a sacred text which defines our categories of experience, uh, you know, the, a priesthood that that has authority over our soul, um, and um, and and then these rituals of these of these pills, uh, which you know, some of which are largely placebo in their effect. Yeah. So this is this is also a kind of you know, I mean, if we're talking like new religions, that is. I'm not saying that it doesn't work. <laughs> so calling something a new religion is not to say that it doesn't have positive effects as well as negative effects. But I mean, I would say psychiatry is far more powerful and shaping of our culture um, than like some like QAnon, obviously. Yeah. I mean, so and so some of these new religions are are so much part of our landscape that we don't even notice them anymore. They're the water we swim in. Yeah. And some of the aspects of the modern, like you said, psychiatry or medicine, all of these things, they offered some aspects of the religio in terms of, like you said, this transformation of these modes of being instead of, instead of personifying them, let's say, and having them as being these principalities that act upon us, rather seeing them as just these biological, it's hard to know even what they think they are. Like if you can identify something like panic and you can identify it across an entire population, well, it, it seems that there is a mode of being there, you know, and so if that would have been manifested in a uh, in, a, in the image of a god, let's say in the ancient times, now it's more like a scientific category. But one of the things it didn't offer was a narrative in which to live. And that is why we're seeing, I think, kind of wokeism is an example of where now we have a narrative. We need a story. We need something which which makes us know where we are in history, where we're going, where we're from. And so this is something that is being offered. Science offered it a little bit in terms of enlightenment, this kind of weird enlightenment narrative of progress and of freeing the human person. All of this had all massive religious overtone, you know, undertones in terms of what was what was going on, but there was no communal part, right? There's no place to commune in the scientific narrative. And so you see that with, with these new, like QAnon and wokeism for sure, have this idea that we're communing together in, in, in this story and we're kind of part and we're, we're, we're together towards a, a common purpose and we have a goal and something we need to achieve. All of that is, is, is part of the religious impulse too. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to, to pick up on that uh, and with an image. Uh, so, so part of this, this kind of new format is, is just some images that we can use as conversation starters. And one of the ones I found was this one from, uh, it's two issues of Time magazine, one from 1966 and one from 2017. Um, and I think this speaks to, to what you were both just talking about, about this kind of void that needs to be filled by our religious impulse. And so the cover from 1966 is, is God dead? So really this concept of the, the death of God that we can talk about in a moment. And then in 2017, uh, you know, they put the same cover out, but is truth dead? And for me, I, I really love this because I think it points to the core of the problem, the death of God and the death of truth. I'd be, I'd be curious to hear you guys thoughts on, on one or both of those and how they relate to what we're seeing now, this desire for 
expression of this religious impulse? I mean, I think they're they're inevitably related. I, I think that they're one comes with the other in the sense that the idea of a metaphysical ground that unites us together, it, the fact that we, the, the idea, the problem is also this kind of weird materialist idea of God, let's say that has permeated in the 19th century and then into the 20th century, obviously, even Christians today, a lot of them have a materialist vision of God. But if we understand God as the source of meaning, God as the source of being, you know, like traditional theists understood it, then as you try to, as you re- eliminate that or try to eliminate that, you know, then we're going to see this, we're going to see a fragmentation, a fragmentation of of truth. And so we once we realize that like one of the things we realize now, especially since postmodernism, is that the frame is more important than the information. The manner in which you organize information is way more powerful than the actual information that's inside. And and so and because we can't agree on a frame, like we we can't come together into one frame, one narrative. Then we have what we have is not competing information. We have competing frames, and and that is a war that is very difficult to solve because we're looking at the same information, the very same facts, but because we frame them differently, then we cannot see each other. And, and, uh, and so that is this breakdown. The breakdown has to do with the, with the question of how you frame facts rather than truth in the sense of just factuality. I think the, the death of God and, and the death of truth uh, are somewhat different uh, revolutions i think the um the death of god i i I think of it as you know beginning in around you know in in the kind of 17th century and it's the establishment of a new god which is rational scientific truth uh and a new paradigm a new accepted paradigm which is a kind of the materialist paradigm and scientists are the best qualified to, to tell us what is reliable and what is true. Um, and the death of truth, in a way, is, I don't know, the kind of, to some extent, the challenge of that paradigm. Um, so it's the challenge of, of a particular consensus, which was partly secular materialist, but even more uh, liberal economics. Um, which I guess is, you know, is, is in some way connected. I suppose the liberal economic paradigm, you know, started in around the 17th century as well. But, um, and with that comes, um, as Jonathan talked about, the great religion of progress, which has been such a powerful religion since the Enlightenment. Things are getting better. They will continue to get better. Um, there have been moments when that um, religion of progress has been very much tested, like after World War I. Uh, and you saw from 19, from let's say 1880 to 1940, a similar period to now, uh, this breakdown of the religion of progress, all kinds of alternative beliefs and conspiracies and magical thinking break, uh, you know, appearing. Um, so, and I and I think Jonathan is is right in that at the moment the, the the death of truth is is that we're in a kind of more pluralist world. Um, there is not one ruling truth. There is not one ruling myth. And, and I think in a way that's very difficult for, for democracies, but it's also somewhat necessary because the old ruling myth of um, liberal economics, everything can just keep growing, uh, that, you know, that has to be challenged. I mean, that's coming up against natural pushback. Um, but we as humans uh, are really struggling to agree, you know, what should be, how to adapt, what should be the new ruling myth. So we're in a, a time of turbulence, and, and I think we will be for several years. Mm. Yeah, I, I love the the idea of both of the need for new myths, and then also what Jonathan was saying about our frames, and the whole idea of framing. Um, you know, I... Um, I've been thinking about this a lot recently and, and specifically, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of relational frame theory, but it's a kind of branch of philosophy that was kind of inspired the third wave of cognitive behavior therapy that I'm going to probably summarize it quite poorly, but just very simply, you know, we have a kind of web of language and each reference points to another one. So we live in this kind of web of frames. 
And what I think is particularly interesting um, is is the relationship between practices, dialogue practices, and certain um, you know practices that I I quite enjoy doing to break those frames. Um, because on the one hand, we have you know postmodernism and and its religions like wokeism. Um, being obsessed with the frame and having a battle, like a kind of complete narrative warfare over frames. On the other hand, you have people going into these digital campfires um, and practicing what, what John Brubeke calls dialogos, to have this kind of you know, Socratic style dialogues or inquiry or kind of meditative processes to talk through our frames in order to kind of break free from them. So, you know, it strikes me that the, the kind of things I enjoy doing are sort of that religious impulse as well coming out. And there's there is something that's shared, it seems, of a kind of liberation from frames in a way. I wonder if that's something that people are all to some degree looking for, to, to be free from the constriction of uh, the frames that they're in. Uh, that just comes to me now. I'm not sure I'm not sure if that is something you guys have. have but I, I think that the frame that frames are inevitable in the sense that this is the problem of the combinatorial explosion that John Ravicki talks about, that, that that there are too many facts. So because there are too many facts, we need to consolidate them into coherent wholes. And this happens through a, a, a kind of attention. You know, you, you, you have a way of attending to things. Um, and so I think it's, it's inevitable. The problem is whether or not the frames are, how high the frames are, let's say. Because if you use weaponized frames, you could say, you can, you can have these weaponized frames that are organized by a single purpose. And then what, what ends up happening is you actually end up ignoring a bunch of stuff and trying to fit everything into that frame. Wokeism is a good example of that, where you have, you have a very tight knit idea of what runs the world. And then you try to fit everything into that, that purpose. And so every behavior that someone has, has to fit into that purpose. Like, it, are you a racist or not? And it's like, as if everything you say is, is, is the question is whether you're a racist or not. And the problem is that, that question that that question doesn't answer what reality is. It actually leaves too much aside. It it you know it, it boxes in boxes it into too tightly. So the idea is to have a, a frame that are bigger, you know, and that actually contain most things. Like one that's one of the things that I've been trying to do. I think in the symbolic world is to try to represent cosmic hierarchies. Uh, you know, that are very universal that you find in every culture that include both the highest and the lowest that show you the place for the outsider and the margin, but also how things stack up towards being and then towards the infinite. And so all of this is, is, is a way to try to help people have something which leaves, that doesn't exclude, that has room for everything in it. Uh, obviously, it's not perfect, but it's a way to break away from these these problematic, like political frames, like political frames are problematic because if you see all reality through politics, then you end up necessarily having an enemy that cannot be redeemed because they'll have another political position from you. And then what do you do with them? Because they just don't fit in your thing, only as an enemy, let's say. I, I, I guess I haven't read about relational frame theory directly, but I've come across it through the cognitive therapies. Um, so, you know, in the 60s, people loved uh, Korsbisky. Is that, am I pronouncing him right? Uh, like semantics theory. How, well, it's he's not really known so much now, but someone like, he really influenced cognitive behavioral therapy, really influenced Albert Ellis. People like Aldous Huxley and Alan Watts were very into him. And he was about how our reality is very much constructed through words. And then we mistake the words and the terminology for reality itself. Um, so, but... Um, are people looking for that now? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think people want certainty. They want um, a comfort blanket, which they can hold on to and rely on, uh, and that will give them the answer so they don't have to keep thinking every day. Um, they, they, I say they, we want uh, certainty and security at an extremely deep level. Um, and I mean, to be provocative, one can even see that in the kind of intellectual dark web. People who um, say they want a kind of global theory, an integrative theory, a theory of theories. And yet sometimes um, within that world, pe people who, who think they've got a kind of global cosmic theory, and yet they're referring to like six or seven thinkers. 
like the same six or seven thinkers who all talk to each other and refer to each other's words works do you know what i mean i remember someone did a map of how they connect like six six you know people and i'm like that that is not that is not a, a map of meaning that's going to cover oh sorry uh, that is not a map of meaning that's going to cover the cosmos that's a tiny little you know <laughs> that's a tiny little napkin um, which is fine, and, and and I just think that's inevitable because, of course, reality is so is 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 huge and mysterious. So I would, I would suggest there's an alternative one can do. It, it, instead of trying to fit everything into a huge Lego map uh, or Lego Lego kind of version of the world, uh, uh, is also to learn. I think that's that's noble, but and, but also to learn to shrug and say I don't know. Like, I have. I find myself, you know, becoming more agnostic as I get older and more OK with saying um, I don't know. Uh, and and, and that, that, that I am accepting my parochialism in the universe. Uh, to be human is to be parochial. Uh, we are a tiny little corner of, 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 the, of the multidimensional multiverse. Uh, and that that's that's OK. Right. It's like Thomas Aquinas say. Thomas Aquinas builds the grand Aristotelian scholastic theory of everything. Uh, and then he has a, an ecstatic experience and says, everything I've, I've produced is straw. So these are both noble impulses. On the one hand, to construct the grand theory that, that fits everything. And on the other hand, to accept our parochialism and, and, and the limits of our knowledge and our, and our agnosticism. Yeah, I want to pick up on that that point of our innate desire, which I certainly share, to have certainty, to be part of a, a wider cohesive whole. And it, it kind of brings us to, to our next image, which is uh, an image from the 1990s in Japan. And this is an image of a, a religious group. So in the 1990s, you know, as I was kind of delving into this subject, um, a couple of people made me aware of this, that in the late 80s and 90s, Japan had an explosion of new religious movements, quite a few of them. And, and very tragically, one of them led to the, the sarin gas attack um, as well in the Tokyo subway. But that wasn't the only group. There were, there were quite a few. And this is a protest by a group called Kufuku no Kagagu. And they uh, were protesting in this picture, they were protesting um, the display of pubic hair on magazine covers because that was normally blurred out by Japanese magazines. And some magazines had started uh, not blurring them out and people were reading them on subways, et cetera. So this was kind of part of their moral stand. And, and overall, these religions, these new religious movements had, had some parallels to what we're seeing now. You know, They were very social justice oriented. They were a response to a very quickly changing society. Um, and a, a lot of them you know, ended tragically. This one uh, is still going, uh, but under the name of Happy Science. And they have branches all around the world and um, widely regarded as, as a cult in, in Japan and abroad. But I think it's what, the reason I wanted to bring it up because I'm really curious about whether what we're seeing with, with phenomena like QAnon or, or wokeism, whether it, that is how culturally specific it is. Because I know you both have an expertise in sort of the history of religion, particularly in the West and particularly the influence of Christianity. So is, is what we're seeing, you know, how closely related is the Christianity or how much is it just something that happens when human beings feel really scared and uncertain? Um, I think it's to, to an extent, it's something that happens uh, when humans feel scared and uncertain. And it's something that happens all the time anyway. Uh, the, the, the universal thing is the desire for meaning, connection, uh, certainty and superiority. We all compare ourselves to each other and want to be better, purer, that kind of thing. Um, but the forms it takes are culturally specific. Uh, the, the weird new fusions will tend to riff off themes from the past. So, um, so QAnon, um, you know, has aspects of um, Christian apocalyptic myth, has aspects of... Uh, millennia old um anti-jewish and anti-christian um you know blood libel uh baby sacrificing myths um 
so yeah and i imagine it's probably the same in other cultures um you know in in china when china was at war with the uh, the british there was the boxer rebellion and there was this magical belief that the warriors would be immune to the english bullets and that probably tapped into some you know older chinese belief um or like the ghost dance rebellion in native american cultures probably tapped you know in some ways it was a form of magical thinking which tapped into older cultural beliefs so i think the cultural forms will be specific to different cultures yeah i think i i would agree with most most of what is said in terms if you look at um especially the qanon thing it really is a descendant of the the ancient kind of, it's a really descendant of the ancient witch hunts that happened, you know, in early modernism. And you can see that the 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 type of accusations and the type of vision of the world is is similar, that there are secret cabals of, uh, of people who are performing some kinds of sacrifices and that, that are that are engaging in in reprehensible acts for spiritual power and that they and that those are kind of hidden among us and they manifest, you know, in when you see a uh, social breakdown and you see a kind of panic of uh, things are changing and things are, are, the world is, seems to be falling from under your feet, then those types of images seem to appear. A lot of the imagery is actually identical to something you would find in the witch's hammer, for example, you know, in terms of what, what you see, or, or as Jewel said, the, the blood libel accusations. Um, and so, but I think the thing I, I was thinking about what Jewel said before and I, I'm kind of trying to, to 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 process it, and I think one of the difficulties I have is that that let's say the need for safety, like the need to to feel secure in your narrative and and storytelling, like that's a human characteristic. It's a human characteristic which is which is very reasonable because we need we need that. And so I don't feel totally satisfied with the answer of telling me, well, we need to be agnostic and need to be just open because the reality is that only a very few amount of people in the world will have that capacity. I guess in terms of conspiracy theories, what I what I don't quite understand about conspiracy theorists is the skepticism towards official authority. I get that. But why the credulousness towards alternative sources of authority? Why why the kind of, you know, why why this double standard of, of being completely suspicious of official authorities? Oh, that you know, there's that's definitely not true. But then accepting hook, line, and sinker, what you know the Q account says, for example, or what David Icke says. So I don't understand. I mean, but you this know, has been going <laughs> on for centuries. This is not new, right? This has been going on since the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation told that. us the authority is wrong, and they've been hiding the truth from us for fifteen hundred years. That's what the, Reform the Reformation said. They've been hiding the truth for us for 1,500 years, or a thousand years, let's say at least a thousand years. You know, Constantine distorted Christianity. They've been hiding the truth for us for a thousand years. And now we're finally going to reveal, we're going to find the actual truth by digging into the facts ourselves. And so this is something in the West that's just been pervasive since the end of the Middle Ages. And it's just been yeah. accelerating and manifesting in different different ways and, and so I it's suppose, not surprising it's still there and i suppose like protestantism actually once you re reject the official version of the truth often there's a kind of constant rejection so uh, something else becomes a trustworthy authority but then that's rejected too so you see that in the QAnon movement fox news is reliable oh no no they're not they're heretics too uh, alex jones is kind of reliable oh no he's you know so there's a kind of perpetual rejection that controlled opposition in in uh, conspiracy thinking, the idea of controlled opposition is very difficult because as soon as you don't agree with something, then it can become controlled opposition right away. The, one of the problems that's happening also in the official narrative and the, is that there are some conspiracies which are socially acceptable and there's some conspiracies which are not socially acceptable. And then there's a war of conspiracy theories. I mean, we were fed a conspiracy theory that Donald Trump is basically a Mancurian candidate from Russia for four years. That is a conspiracy yep. theory, and, and it was I an agree. officially sanctioned conspiracy theory. And then the same people that are feeding us a conspiracy theory are then looking on the other side and saying, you're a conspiracy theorist. You know, when you say that Clinton did this or that, it's all conspiracy theory. And so it's, it, it's not that there's just one group 
that are conspiratorial. It's like everybody has entered into this weird like state of 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 believing in these weird in these kind of uh, you know these shady deals and everything. I 100% agree, and I think um, uh, secular liberals at the moment, you know, love articles about how how loony and conspiratorial the right is, and totally does not recognise uh, conspiracy thinking on the left. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, uh, you know, so I saw a, a tweet recently, um, you know, saying exactly that that that, that the left has been peddling. Russian conspiracy theories about Cambridge Analytica and and all of that for for four or five years, uh, and, and 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 never thought that that was undermining democracy. Um, so um, so I completely a, 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 a agree with you, Jonathan. But it's a wonder. It's a it's a it's a wondrous thing that's going on. It's actually it's actually amazing. If anybody has any memory of 2016, if you remember the, the news articles and the news reports about Dominion machines and how they were, can be, that they could be hacked and how Russia probably hacked Dominion machines. And now, now the right is saying it and the left is saying, how can you say that? That's horrible. It's all conspiracy yeah, theory. Yeah. It's this just is, hilarious. This is, the, this is the death of reason. It's hilarious. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Yeah, just, if you watch that, the, the Netflix thing uh, hacked off, it's t- total conspiracy theory, and 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 as well the kind of the left's, um, some people on the left's um, canonization of uh, of uh, Julian Assange as this Jesus-like figure, uh, and 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 the kind of conspiracy theories around that. Yeah, yeah, it strikes me. I mean, something for the UK, you know, an extreme version of of kind of uh, Corbyn's government just being sort of unwilling to look at anti-Semitism as. Uh, an issue. It's like, but you know, because you know, anti-Semitic conspiracy, or let's say, certainly an, an anti-Zionist sentiment, is huge in in certain areas of the left, but kind of yeah. unexamined and has been for for a very long time. So uh, I want to talk with our final image. I want to um, talk a little bit about this. One of the weirder blends uh, of um, different belief systems that have come together, and this is an image of the idea of this kind of blending that's now happening between different uh you know different worldviews different beliefs that have been you know different theories that have been on the internet for a long time and specifically you know in this case the new age and the far right and this is something that that you've written on Jules and uh, but I think it speaks also to a to a wider process of this kind of um mainstreaming of of uh yeah certain ideas and certain um uh, theories, but Jules, maybe you could talk about uh, first to start us off. What is conspirituality? Because that's a term that you've been uh, pretty yeah. major in, in popularizing recently. Uh, well, it was just uh, something I noticed in March and April that uh, leading figures in my community, which is kind of spirituality type um, culture, um, was sharing what I took to be wild and implausible conspiracy theories. Uh, like the documentary Plandemic, the Pizzagate documentary Out of Shadows, the David Icke interview on London Real. So I wondered, why is this? Why are uh, leading representatives in in my culture, to my mind, making it worse and harming you know the the, the conversation and and putting people uh, at risk rather than helping and supporting people? Um, I found a, 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 an essay from 2011 called Conspirituality by two anthropologists, David Voas and Charlotte Ward, um, where they noted the overlap between uh, New Age spirituality and conspiracy thinking and um, asked why that was. Um, and I think there are kind of personality trait reasons that some people who are drawn to New Age spirituality are also um, seem to show similar personality traits as people who are drawn to conspiracy theories. Um, and that is, for example, things like an, uh, what, what is sometimes called schizotypal thinking, which, which sounds very bad, but it's not necessarily bad. It just means openness to unusual beliefs and unusual experiences. So that's also open to maybe altered states of consciousness, uh, trance states, that kind of thing. Um, there's also sometimes um, suspicion of authority, suspicion of official truth, suspicion of uh, official medicine. So that kind of overlaps with both of them. 
And then a bit more negatively, there's there's kind of narcissism, uh, thinking that you know the special truth. You're one of the special ones who's seen through the illusion uh, and has been liberated into the truth. And then there are cultural and technological reasons. Just one I would talk about here is um, a useful phrase called the acculture. Uh, the acculture is the kind of subculture of alternative fringe or forbidden beliefs and knowledge, uh, which is kind of always there. And um, because it's quite deinstitutionalized and quite liminal, um, often beliefs will hop uh, from one category to another and sometimes fuse together. I compare it to like a Chinese wet market where you have different viruses that might hop from species to species and mutate and fuse together. And sometimes they would fuse together in weird ways. In 1920s Russia, for example, magical, um, mystical, theosophical thinking fuses with um, Bolshevik ideas to form this weird thing called cosmism, uh, which is the idea that science is going to resurrect everyone who's ever died. Uh, you know, in, in, in Germany, you get the weird fusion of far right, volkish nationalist thinking with occult thinking sometimes. So you have someone like Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, who carries around a copy of the Bhagavad Gita and gets his SS soldiers to practice yoga, sends expeditions off to speak, you know, to meet the Dalai Lama. You get the deputy Fuhrer Rudolf Hess being very into um, alternative medicine and getting inmates in concentration camps to grow plants for his alternative medicines. Um, this is not to say that the new age is inherently fascist, which is what some people like to claim, like Theodore Adorno tried to claim that, that it's essentially irrational and therefore leads to fascism. It's more that it's, it's fluid and fluxy. So you can have liberal new ages and you could, but you can also have, um, fascist new ages. And it's, and it's something we see now in, in QAnon. And it's something people pointed out in the 90s as well, like New Age fascism. So, um, yeah, it has it has been around for a bit. Well, one of the things for sure has to do with the notion of secret knowledge, as you note, as you mentioned, and this goes all the way back to the Gnostics. Like the Gnostics were also very conspiratorial because they believed that the hierarchy of principalities were were mischievous like that the that the hierarchies of principalities that rule the world were evil and so because of that they tended to want to free themselves from any type of authority structure because the authority structures are necessarily evil right uh and you, like i said you see there's something protestant about that as well where the idea of a hierarchy of authority is necessarily evil now the problem is that sometimes it's true um and the difficulty is that sometimes conspiracies are true so that's what's that's what's hard is that, you know, is, I, you wish that someone would have known about the conspiracies to 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 create the Bolshevik revolution, because those were conspiracies to overthrow the Russian, the, you know, and you would wish you would have known about the conspiracies to kill the king in France because they were conspiracies to kill the king in France. So there are conspiracies. Um, and so you need you actually do need some a, a, a type of person to be able to see patterns in an unusual way, to maybe get, grab something that you that you missed, you know, because you're just kind of following the normal pattern that has been given to you. So that characteristic, that human characteristic seems to be a, a useful characteristic, you know, the capacity to, to notice patterns outside of the official hierarchy, outside of the one that's that's laid out. Uh, and so, and so the, the difficulty right now is that one is that it, go, it gets out of control. It's like, I feel myself pulled in that direction. Like I feel myself looking at the media narrative and seeing how they're denying certain things which are obviously real. And so I'm like, well, where do I look now? Like, where do I look to find my information? Mm -hmm. Because I'm being lied to. And then the other, the people that talk about the other stuff are, yeah, anyways. Mm. I mean, I wanna just add to that. And I, I very much agree um, that, uh, you know, all established beliefs, start off as forbidden knowledge. Um, the idea that the earth rotates around the sun was, was a crackpot conspiracy theory originally, or forbidden belief. Um, all of, so good stuff comes from that wild subculture. All of psychology came from the occulture. 
it came from stuff like mesmerism, which was dismissed. It, you know, it came from psychical research, which was dismissed. Um, the other thing I, I, I want to say, which I think is useful to mention in, in this discussion, is about um, altered states of consciousness and their and their usefulness and, 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 and incorporating them into a kind of more holistic integrated vision of reality, but also their um, slipperiness. So I think what one also sees in conspiracy thinking is in some ways a kind of um, dream type thinking or trance type thinking or kind of psychedelic type thinking. I would just say again that there's something valuable in this stuff. Don't just dismiss it as crazy irrationalism. It, you know, that the kind of sleep of reason produces monsters. I would argue that there is a value to all these different forms of consciousness. It's just about applying the wrong form of consciousness to, the, to, the, to a situation. When you have a highly complex political situation, don't necessarily bring the dream mind, or at least if you do, be a little careful with it. Don't apply it too literally. Recognize that this is the subconscious, which has very useful, valuable things to say, but maybe don't apply a literal fundamentalist kind of mindset to it. You get. One of the, the I guess I'm one of the problems is materialism. It, it's it, it, the problem is that everything is only on one level, and so these patterns of being that that manifest themselves in stories and and in these types of visions that people have they they're real like they're 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 not just made up i don't even know what that word means in in terms of like the idea that you can make things up that aren't actually a, a pattern of reality and so it's the instantiation sometimes which we get which get loopy right the way that you instantiate it but like you said a lot of the the a lot of the patterns that like i i actually sometimes like i, I actually made a video on alex jones where i i look at alex jones and i look i try to see through his hyperbolic language and because he has this hyperbolic kind of mythological way of speaking of things. And you you kind of try to scratch at it a little bit and you see that behind it, there are some things that are uh, pushing far, but there's some things which are not that weird at all. It's just because it's just because there, the, he tends to use this kind of mythological way of speaking. <laughs> and, and, and this is a debate in Christianity as well, which someone like you, you'll find in someone like Rowan Williams is writing that he will talk about the impoverishment of Christian um, theology, um, the collapse in, in the kind of um, early Christian fathers or medieval mystics, there's the idea of multiple ways of knowing and multiple ways of reading the Bible. Um, the mystics would talk about there's the literal meaning and then there's the mystical meaning and, and this kind of thing. And then that gets collapsed into there is literal. just the literal meaning. That's right. Mm. Yeah, and it's hard to deal with that. It's really difficult because someone who falls there is is it's they're kind of they're certain and they're asleep in their kind of certainty, and so it's hard to break their mold because they they have a kind of aggressive certainty in the way that they interpret things. But and it seems like there's a theme here that 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 seems to be coming out, which is that we have on the one side the kind of ecstatic kind of weirdness that is necessary and that is the thing that challenges us as as societies as people to find the information that is hidden to to kind of rejuvenate and then at the same time we have structures and i know from from working as a psychedelic guide that you have to have a very safe firm clear structure in within which people can have ecstatic experience and within which people can challenge. And of course, we had that for a very long time. You know, the example you just gave, Jules, it's like, yes, you can have all those different ways of knowing and all those different possibilities when you have a structure that has enough cohesion that you can kind of relax into it in a sense, or it can contain some of it. I think what we're seeing now is, I think it's unique to this time and place. You know, I, I really do, because it's, I think it's a simulated religion. I think what we're seeing is a kind of decentralized internet religions. So they don't have leaders, you know, they don't have leaders. And therefore, there isn't really that checks and balances. There isn't really that container for some ideas to, to kind of flourish and some to go, nah, that's a little bit too far. A kind of agreed, an agreed uh, ontology even of like, why are we human beings? And without that, I think we get this kind of eruption of 
everything complete yeah. post but it's a postmodern it's it's the religion of postmodernism in a sense well i i i agree i i think you know how, how does this play out i think it you know things things settle down when 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 we're slightly less in crisis and feeling under various forms of existential threat and i don't you know and i i think things just kind of settle down and maybe some kind of consensus emerges out of that um and 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 i guess i so i don't feel necessarily the need to fix the present like i you know i did for about a week i thought i'm like i've got to go online and and, and get into every vaccine discussion but but actually it comes back to faith like i have a kind of you know we all have different forms of faith this is something william james talks about we all have over beliefs based, based on faith and i have a kind of faith that it will turn out okay that like uh, we're in the stormy rapids and then we're going to come to a calmer bit of the river and and I, I don't quite know what it looks like or whether I'll I'll be there but I have faith that you know around the next corner of this you know this white water bit of the river there's a calmer stretch yeah that I mean I think that that's for sure like every story is about that every story is about the descent into madness and then the the resurrection at the end and so it, it, the problem is that sometimes it can go pretty low. <laughs> like the 20th yeah. century, it went pretty low. I I tend to think that we've actually been on a pause. Like after World War II, the the, the 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 catastrophe of World War II made put the world on pause for about two gen few generations, and that now that pause is over and it's going to accelerate again. So hopefully it doesn't get too low before it starts going back up again. It sounds like you guys are suggesting that 2021. No, well, Jules, Jules, you think might might uh, we have a flow? D Jonathan sounds like you're suggesting we can look forward to a 2021, which is it's gonna this was all just worse. a prep for that, and oh we're uh, we're in for a wild ride. I think we're in for. I think it's not. This is just starting. I think I don't think it's going to get better very soon. That's for sure. <laughs> Sorry. So <laughs> might be time to buckle up, uh, or Maybe not, we need to as, as the up. case may be. <laughs> Thank so you, guys, thank and, you. you know. Yeah, thank you so much for this. Uh, re really, really insightful and uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho-Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.